Let's talk about murder. How about that, okay? This is the sixth commandment, and uh, you can turn with me in your scripture. You have your Bibles open. I've got a lot of scripture I want to put out, but everything we want to do is going to be based in the Word and the scriptures of God. God breathed upon the Word, amen? That means it's alive, and it, it is, is sharp, it's active, and it cuts to the very marrow and bone of a human being. It becomes a reflection. You look in that book, and it tells you where you're at in accordance with the book, meaning with the Spirit of God. Amen. So do not be afraid of the Bible, the Word of God, and uh, keep, keep one on you. If you. Most people have phones today, and there's all kinds of Bible apps on phones. And uh, you, get, you can get Bible studies on those. You can do Bible studies with people through your phones. It's amazing through that technology what you can do. But the key is, is get your heart and get your face in the Word of God and let it get in you. Amen. So in, um, in Exodus, I believe it's chapter 20, verse 13, the King James says, Thou shalt not murder. Father, we thank you. For the holy word of God. And there's always a reason for every scripture. We don't want to misrepresent it. But Father we want to rightly divide it. And we want to know Father how your spirit applies it to our lives. Even today in November of 2023. Because your word never is. It's never non-relative. It's always relative. It's always active. It's a right now word. So we thank you for that today. And may it just be emblazoned upon our hearts and our minds this day. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, there was a judge by the name of Alexander Sanders, Jr. He was a chief justice of the Supreme Court in South Carolina. He tells a story one day about what happened to his daughter named Zoe when she's three years old. Sanders came home from work one day to find his home, find his home, especially his young daughter, in a state of turmoil. Zoe's pet turtle had died. She was crying as if her heart would break. You know, anybody been there with your little one? Zoe's mother had been dealing with the situation all day. She declared it was now dad's turn to try and make things better. Sanders told Zoe that they could go to the pet store and just buy another one just like the one that had died. Yet even at three years of age, Zoe was smart enough to know that that turtle wasn't a toy. There's really no such thing as getting another one just like the one who died. So Zoe's tears continued, desperate to quiet his little daughter's tears. He said, I tell you what, we'll have a funeral for the turtle. So being three years old, she didn't know what a funeral was. Scrambling to come up with an explanation, as well as something that would get, off, get her mind off the turtle's death, he said, a funeral is like a birthday party. We'll have ice cream and cake and lemonade and balloons and all the children in the neighborhood will come over to our house to play all because the turtle died. Well, the idea of a funeral sure turned a trick for Zoe. Instantly, she's happy. She's smiling. The turtle's death was no longer a cause for tears, but a reason to rejoice. So with visions of cake and ice cream and friends and balloons in her head, they both looked down at the deceased turtle lying there at their feet. And as they did, the turtle began to move. A few seconds later, the old turtle crawled away, but undeniably alive. Zoe quickly considered her options, looks up at her dad with her big, beautiful eyes, and with all the innocence of three-year-old tender heart, says, Daddy, let's kill it. <laughs> she wanted a funeral. Now, if I get a call from Bill Ben or Paul Hudson, I'm going to remember that. So. so remember that at our next dinner. We've got ice cream, cake, and balloons, right? Oh, good. Sometimes it's just good to have a little levity in the midst of something so serious. Amen? Well, we've been going backwards. We started at 10. Now we're up to 6 or back to 6, if you want to call it. But, you know, and I, I think most of you know this, but, you know, when, when the, the the Pharisees, they're, of course, they're offended by Jesus. They don't believe in him, and they don't want to follow him because they're insecure in their leadership, right? They don't want nobody worshiping this guy from, you know, from Nazareth because they don't believe in he's the Messiah. So they're always trying to trick him. You know, how do you trick Jesus, the Son of God, right? So they say, hey, hey, good teacher, what's, what's the greatest commandment, right? 
Well, we've got him now because whatever he says, he's going to be wrong, right? Well, Jesus takes all 10, sums them up in two. And really, that's the heart of the Father. And all 10 are for us. It's not just a bunch of don'ts, but really, it's, it's, a, it's a, a pathway to true life and true living. And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And when you read them, that's the first four. It's you and God. It's the vertical relationship. And then the next, five to ten, is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because most people don't have a problem loving themselves. But love your neighbor like you'd love yourself. That's the next six. So he sums them up in two. So everything we've looked at so far has to do with how you and I relate. How do I treat you? How do you treat me? Why do we treat each other this way, right? It doesn't have to be husband and wife, brother and sister. It can be how you treat your person at work, how you treat the person at the, at the post office, or who you give your money to when you walk into a gas station. These are our neighbors, how we value and look at each other. So in the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. I want to focus on three things. Number one is the value of life. If you're going to look at murder, you have to start what does it mean to value life? And number two is the meaning. What is the, what is the essence, the meaning of this commandment? And number three, what's the application Jesus made to that commandment to your and I life, to our lives today? Because there's an application Jesus made right now as we sit in real time in 2023. It wasn't just etched in stone, put in Moses' hands, and brought down off the mountain thousands of years ago. This is something you and I can relate to right now in this day, in this age, and we should. Amen? It's God's heart. So number one, what is the value of a life? Well, the sixth commandment settles that issue once and for all. God places the highest value on each and every human life, right? As Christian, you may call yourself, I am pro-life. But no matter how greatly you and I value life, the values, the values of life of each and every man, woman, boy, and girl, infinitely, God loves them more than we do. So why is life so valuable to God, right? Because we actually have a way of placing value on other humans. But the real value, and I've shared this before, but as a matter of fact, I think I maybe shared it yesterday at a funeral. When you read Matthew 8, Jesus asks a question. He looks around and says, well, what does it profit a man? Now, they all understood profit. Now, I'm not talking about ET. I'm talking about IT. Everybody understand profit? You all like to profit, right? You need to profit. You can't pay your bills. You go broke, right? You need to profit. Jesus, what does it profit you, man or woman, any human being on the face of the planet, if you regain the whole world? Now, stop for a minute. How much is that? Can you give me a dollar value? Anyone? Well, we're $33 trillion in debt as a nation. Well, that's the figure on the clock in New York. But if you add in everything else, what we owe through Social Security, all these things, we're actually closer to $300 trillion. Now, figure those numbers. Can you add those many zeros? Do so you understand debt? We're indebted above our heads. But Jesus says, what does it profit you if you gain that and more? Because that's not considering all the assets of the entire planet. How many own property? How many like your property be, to be worth a lot of money when you're getting ready to sell it? How many like to be less though when the tax guy comes by? We can't have it both ways, right, Carrie? It's going to be one way or the other. And the fact is, add, add the assets, the property values of the entire planet. You get the idea? You can't, humans can't come up with that kind of number. But Jesus says, your soul is worth more than that. So why do you hang it on to that stuff for, right? Why do you hang on to stuff? He says, your soul is over. But we put more value, we place more value on stuff. Come on, folks. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, Americans? Then we do somebody's soul. And sometimes our silence to other souls speaks volumes. See, God is the giver and sustainer of all life. No, you're not a cosmic accident. You are not a product of evolution. You're not the, just the result of biology. 
God has ordained your life. Hear me. God has ordained your life this morning. Jeremiah 1, 5. I knew you before I formed you. Before I formed you. Guess what? God formed you. He knew you before you were who? Formed in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. Now, God's already in motion in your life before you ever came out of the womb. And I appointed you to be a prophet to my nations. Whatever it is God's appointed you to, he's already done it before you came through the womb. In the beginning, God created everything that existed out of nothing. Isn't it amazing? There's nothing and then there's everything because God speaks it. Everything that exists was created by his spoken word. From the dust of the ground, God formed man with his own hand. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and did this. He breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. And then the man became a living being. It's amazing how God's breath brings things to life. Now, I know it's going to shock some people, but human life is not the same as animal life. Okay, Fifi is not going to heaven with you, okay? We're all made of the same stuff, but we alone, it's called imago dei, the image of God. We alone have been made in the image of God. God created animal by, by life, by speaking in the distance, but humans came into life by the breath of God to make us a living soul. And what's the value of that? More than the entire planet. Moreover, human life was created in God's perfect image. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the, guess who's boss? Your boss over those fish. Some like that. Your boss over the birds of the air. You have say so over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that is on the earth, including those reptiles. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And get this, there's two of them. Just to remind us, in the crazy day and age where there's two of them. He called one male. He called one female. He created them. Enough said, period, done, okay? Murder is not simply the taking of someone's life. It's actually the attempt to destroy the image of God, which is a part of every human life. God also sustains life, okay? He's not just the giver, but he sustains your life. Why does your heart keep beating day in and day out without you thinking much about it? Let me ask you, from the time I just said that, to for the first time your feet hit the floor this morning, whatever time that was, how many times have you thought about the, the, the act of your heart beating? Does it still beat? Yeah? Okay, how many have thought about this? Every breath you take and your lungs function to keep you alive since you got up this morning till just now. I actually didn't think about it until I read this earlier this morning. I don't wake up and think about my heart beating. I don't wake up and think about my lungs breathing in and out. So what really keeps us alive? Well, who started it? Who got the first breath? Adam did. Hasn't stopped since then, has it? So God has passed on his living breath on and on and on. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. If, if, just big if, if God were to cease to exist, guess what would happen to us? Everything falls apart. Everything, the entire planet, the universe, the, everything ceases. Hebrews 1, 2. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he has sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. If Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When he had cleansed us from our sins, not if, when he had cleansed us from our sins, Paul speaking there, or other writers speaking the Hebrews, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Whew. It's accomplished. It is finished. Done. Now let's move on to the next thing. God preserves our life. It is God who keeps us alive for he holds our lives in his hand. Amen. I love the old song, Jesus, hold my hand. So what is the meaning of the sixth commandment? 
What does God forbid with this commandment? So what's he telling us? Literally, the sixth commandment says, you shall not commit murder. The commandment does not say, thou shalt not kill in the Hebrew. The sixth commandment is simply a prohibition against killing even God is, if, if, if that, listen, if, if God didn't mean that, then God broke his own law. <gasps> he did. If that's what he meant. How do we know? Well, let's go back to the beginning. What happened when Adam and Eve made a bad decision? They had to have their sin covered because the fig leaf wasn't working. Aren't you glad? You all be wearing fig leaves today, right? There had to be the shedding of blood to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. So he kills an animal. God himself, we call it sacrifice. He took an animal, killed it to provide the covering for their nakedness. It was a blood covering for their sin. See, there's no remission, no forgiveness and wiping away of sin without the what? The shedding of blood. So what does the commandment not forbid? Well, let's look at that. It doesn't forbid the killing of animals, right? Where's our deer hunters? Aren't you glad? You can kill a deer legally, and God won't hold it against you. That's a good thing to eat that deer. Don't trophy hunt. Eat that deer. I'll tell you what. There was a day in this part of Missouri, that's what you lived on. You hunted and you fished, not because you, you, you took it to the taxidermist and stuck it on your wall to look at or to scare your wife in the middle of the night, but you ate it. It was life. It was sustenance. Amen? God gave animals, command us food to eat. Jesus proclaimed all foods clean, by the way. How many remember that? In the vision that God showed Peter, all types of unclean animals that the Jews would not want to eat in order to fulfill their law, but God told Peter... Kill it and eat it, all right? How many have ever, how many in their lifetime have you ever eaten thing, something that people will turn their nose up at, right? How many have ever eaten a possum? Okay. But the generation before us had possum because why? They got hungry. My grandpa said it was greasy, but it's better than starving to death. How many have ever had raccoon? Hey, they clean their food. My grandma was a, was a wonderful coon cooker. Loved it. You eat eggs, where does that come from? Hello. Chicken. How many, how many, how many watched an old pig waller and you eat, you love your bacon, right? Absolutely. What God says is clean, you can eat it. Amen. Now, the sixth commandment does not forbid capital punishment. Deuteronomy 1921, show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. But let's go to Romans 13, 1. Everyone must, be, must submit to govern, governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions have authority, have been placed there by God. So if anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against God, what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. I began to think of that this morning. I thought, okay, there was a couple that lied. And this is the beginning of the church. And I'm telling you, man, the, the church is it's just it's growing rapidly. The Spirit of God is moving. People are being healed in the streets. Men and women who have never heard about, quote, the Holy Spirit are being filled with the Holy Spirit. They're prophesying. Uh, we see the gifts in operation. The, the people were the gifts of tongues. and All these gifts, words of wisdom, these are beginning to be activated. Why? Because God wants to win the world for him, and he uses these gifts to win the world, not to show us off. Okay? They're for his glory. We must remember that. And they're selling stuff to bring in to help people. They're even selling properties, lands, and whatever personal uh, items that they had. And an ice of fire had sold a piece of property. But they lied about what they got. He comes in first. 
And guess what? He lied. And what happened to Ananias? He dropped dead in the middle of the church building. Well, wife didn't know about it. They carried him out. The wife comes in. I guess they figured they'll get their story straight together before they come in. And she also what? Now, did Peter kill both of these Ananias and Sapphira? He, he didn't say, okay, off with your heads, or let's go put you up back here. I got a 21-gun salute. We're going to shoot you. No. Who actually do you think did the killing? They were judged, weren't they? Because they lied. This was the beginning of the church. It is new and it's fresh, and God's serious about, you know, this, this purity, the righteousness of man's heart. And, they, and remember what Peter said? He said, you didn't lie to me. Who'd you lie to? You lied to the Holy Spirit. And they dropped dead. Now, does this mean we'll go around and start killing people? Absolutely not. You, you do not have a right to murder someone. We do not have that right. The Sixth Commandment does not forbid the protection, does not forbid the protection of your family and home. Exodus 22, 2 and 3, if a thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. How many of you uh, happen to have some type of weapon in your home for your protection? You're not there just to kill people, right? You didn't, you didn't kill the uh, Amazon driver or the FedEx driver or the UPS driver. Now, hopefully, or your postal worker, hopefully you didn't, uh, you maybe left them a gift for Christmas. They work hard for you. They drive them down the road many miles per day, even into the night, your FedEx. See, we say you're a postal worker, not your FedEx driver, your EPS driver, because they are like swarms of locusts around Steelville. It's, I was going to say, yeah. They don't devour, but they sure bring a lot of stuff to people's houses. You know that? The Sixth Commandment does not forbid killing caused through war. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them, because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. I tell you, one of the, one of the things, um, uh, they did a documentary a few years back on the Six-Day War in Israel. And if you watch that doc, it'll literally blow your mind to see how God gave them favor in 1967. Basically, the enemies of the whole Middle East are coming against them. They're well-trained. They've got technology in those days. Israel's barely, what, 19 years old as a nation. And God literally wins that thing for them in six days. It's, it's historical. It's monumental because they even tell you God's hands all over it. Things that, winds that would come up out of nowhere and cause sandstorms against the enemy. God is, God's hand was all in that. 1 Samuel 15, 18, And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Malachites, and fight against them until they be consumed. What does the sixth commandment mean? What type of killing or murder does God forbid? Put simply, because God is the author of life, and each life is of great value to God, then the sixth commandment means God forbids the murder of another human life. Now, murder can happen in different ways. But all murder falls into one of two categories. It's either intentional, premeditated, or it's an indirect murder, so, such as intentional murder is premeditated homicide, right? It's cold-blooded murder. It's intentional taking of a life. I'm going to kill you. There are hit men and so on and so on. We understand that. You, you've, you've seen plenty of, uh, of gang movies and all this type of stuff and the, the mob movies and all this. I'm going to knock you off and... We live in a day where the, the screens of our culture, whether it's TV, your phone, or a computer, are incessantly showing daily movies, television, violence. It is so common what has happened is the public who views it becomes desensitized to the brutality of murder. Someone, someone had listed Chicago as, Shai, was it Shai, Iraq or something like that? Because at one time, there was more deaths happening in Chicago than there was in Iraq. So what does that say about our own nation, right? We live in that day. Do, do things like that still shock you, or is the shock value wore off? How about euthanasia or mercy killing? Did you know euthanasia and mercy killing are still intentional murder? Canada just passed another law that makes it so much easier. Uh, even if you're not suffering this debilitating disease, if you have now mental depression, 
you can actually have someone help you end your life in Canada. Check it out. It's real. How many remember the name Dr. Kevorkian? That even just like, yeah, when you hear that name, right? He actually thought he was providing a service, but in God's eyes, Dr. Kevorkian was committing murder. Suicide, a touchy subject. Suicide, you're sneaking out the back door of life. It's self-murder. Suicide becomes about hopelessness. But in Christ, there is always hope. Matter of fact, in Proverbs, this scripture really, this scripture should be plastered across the country today. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a dream realized brings life. It brings health. It brings peace into a person's life. When Christ, there is always hope. How many would agree in Christ? Now, Christ is eternal, so that means he never goes away. He's still here, as he was on the day he hung on the cross, right? For, for at least about 11, 12, or actually 40 of them, it looked like hopelessness on the day he died. But they had forgotten what he said. Tear this down in three days, all right? they just forgotten what he had said. Then their humanity, they couldn't quite reconcile what he said to what he was about to do. But God, when God says something, he does it. For God so loved the world that he gave. Amen? And Jesus says, listen, in three days, I'm coming back. Okay? Did I not tell you? He said to Martha and Mary, if you believed in me, the resurrection life, right? You'll never die. Absolutely. Now, he wasn't speaking physically. The spiritual sense. Yesterday, when we buried uh, Irene, she's a believer. And we went way out to Westover. Anybody been to Westover Cemetery in the last 400 years except Martha? Nobody lives unless you live in Englandville. I mean, I mean, now, Mar Marthaville, that's in Washington, so. Rarely do many people go to Westover unless it's a funeral every 20 or 30 years. We're back in the woods, and I said, we better have orange hats today if we get out of that back in the woods here. And we parked, and they were crammed in there. We were doing all this, and, and we brought Irene. The, the young boys brought her, brought her casket out, set it there. And, and the scripture that I wanted to use, which I do a lot, but this is for believers because the people need to know who are sitting in those seats, whether believers or not believers, this is not the end of that person. Paul even says at the end of that scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, therefore encourage each other with these words. I want to tell you something. If I knew my old dead body was coming back perfect one day, I would be encouraged. Take a look at yours. Wouldn't you be encouraged too? Are you perfect now? No, you're not. We all need perfection in this body. One day, this body's going to join the spirit together, and we're going up together. Gravity will not, you'll defy the law of gravity on that day. You understand what that means? You will fly. You'll not flap your wings. You'll not need a jet. You'll not need a helicopter. You, built by the power of God, through the spirit of God, through the perfection of your body, and the joining of your spirit, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you shall be with him. Perfect. Suicide does not bring an end to your life. Here's what I mean. Because quite often, the majority of human beings feel life is all about right now. But you are not just right now. What does that mean? You are created with an eternal soul inside of you. This is only part of who you are. Now, that's, that's icing on the cake that God gives us. We get the new body, right? But when we do a funeral and the body or the can of ashes, whatever it is, that's the shell. The real person is not there. They're at one of two places. The scriptures tell us there's not many. There's no purgatory. It's one of two places according to scripture. You're either with him in heaven or in a place called Hades, hell. You're a place where he is not, at least he, personally he's not there. And it's a place of suffering. It's one of two places. So the fact is, you may try to end your personal life and feel you're out of your physical pain, but the fact is now you have eternal pain. And guess what you've done to your family? Created confusion and a lot of pain in your family. Let's go to the next one. And right now, this is a hot topic. It has been for now over 50 years. 1973 was not the origination of the legality of abortion. It was 1969 in the state of New York. 1973 in January was the Supreme Court decision. And then we had national abortion. Abortion is actually intentional murder. 
doesn't matter what you say. You can, use, you can twist those words all you want, but I can show you through the scripture. I've already read you enough scripture to show you that abortion, the ending of the pre-out of the, the pre, the pre here line, is murder. God does not smile on it. Just to give you an idea how much is, how much is and, and it, somebody had posted this, and I thought, well, yeah, it's, 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 it's how we look at stuff. You know, the thing in Gaza and uh, the horrific thing of what happened on October 7th and what they did to little babies, the Israeli babies. So all of a sudden, Israel responds. And I'm sure there are children killed, and, and it's sad, but it's, it's what happens in this type, of, this type of madness. And someone said, we, we really, we march in the streets and protest about that. But did you know, annually, get this, annually, from January 1st to January 1st on the planet, there are literally 38 million babies aborted, murdered. America, it's about 1.8 million annually. In the world, it's 38 million. When Shell and I were in Israel in uh, March of 2011 at the hotel, I'd turn on the, I think it's RT News, they have Israel News. And I never thought much about this, but actually in Israel, they do about 25,000 abortions every year. In Israel, God's chosen in Israel. Abortion. See, God has a purpose for each and every human life. What if Jeremiah's mother, you know what, I just, I'm young, I'm single, I made a mistake, I just can't do this, and I'm embarrassed, let's have an abortion. How many young ladies have felt that way? That's why we have like uh, Lifeline Pregnancy Center in Cuba. The, uh, the, the one in Rala, pregnancy uh, uh, in Rala. To help people. Listen, did you know there are people who cannot have children who would desperately want to have that child? That child has a purpose. I'm going to share a story in just a minute about that. Every human life has a purpose. There's indirect murder. It happens because of a lack of common sense. Indirect murder can be caused by cruelty, right? Criminal neglect or corruption. There's corruption all across this planet. Plenty right here. The drunk driver who killed an innocent life because they got behind the wheel of a vehicle to drive home after a night of drinking and partying or drowning their sorrows. See, drinking is a symptom. The alcoholism and the drug addiction is just something to try to ease the pain that's deeper. But only God can heal that part of your life then you'll have no need for that stuff. How about the parent or the babysitter who shakes an infant? It's happened. And we know people have left children unattended in hot cars. We hear that all the time every summer. How about the husband who beats, or sometimes, I understand a wife has beat her husband, or children and kill them, or maybe killing them a little at a time. How about the pusher who sells drugs and it leads to overdoses. Over 100,000 last year from fentanyl. Fentanyl overdose killed. And it takes about a pinpoint on your little finger to kill many human beings. That's how powerful fentanyl is. God values human life. That means everybody in the room, he values your life. He is the author of life. He knew you. And he loved you in spite of what you and I have done, right? Now, he gives us a free will to make choices, but his love is there. We've been created in his image, Father, Son, and Spirit, body, soul, and spirit. And the Lord sustains us by giving the breath of life each and every day. Therefore, God has commanded us that we do not murder, do not take the lives of the innocent. Well, what about right now? Well, how does Jesus apply that sixth commandment? commandment to our lives today now most in this room i trust i hope and pray we're never convicted in a court of law can you say amen for the murder of someone's life but do we value life in the way that god values life would jesus find us guilty of murder would god find us guilty of murder with our hearts so the question goes in matthew 5 21 words in red you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Verse 22, but I say, 
If you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, anybody ever called somebody an idiot? Have you ever thought it? We're getting to that. You are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, okay, or like coming to church to bring your worship today, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar. That means don't offer it yet. Drop it. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice. Get the heart right before. When we take communion a couple weeks ago, when we always read in Corinthians, and I always read that last part also because he says, you've taken this unworthy. Your heart ain't right with each other. You've got issues going on. You need to go and take care of it. Well, God will forgive me. God will forgive you, but he says, listen, you need to go and get forgiveness from them because if you don't forgive them, I can't forgive you. You know how many people deal with that on a daily basis and they won't forgive others, but they go to God, oh, thank you, God, for your forgiveness. Wait a minute, have you forgiven them? Well, no, it says, well, you're not forgiven yet. There's people take that to the grave with them. This whole thing, the whole thing, it's about really how we live with God and with each other. That's what it's about. See, Jesus sets a higher standard, and murder begins in the heart, not with your 44. It begins in here. That's the end result. And Jesus' statement here is not made to those who are being pagans, but he's speaking to the religious, though it bring offerings to God. The pagan world isn't bringing offerings to God. The church is. The believers. He's speaking to the believers here. He's saying this is how serious this is. He's concerned about the attitude of our hearts toward our fellow man. I said this not, not long ago. At, I think it might have been at the cemetery. I, I didn't know. I don't know all the ins and outs of families. But if you're like the average family, there's some kind of aunt, something going on. And so, you know, somebody's got an issue here. It's not an issue there. My goodness. We're such a wacky world today. And, and families get their own wackiness too. And, but you know what? According to the scriptures, there's absolutely nothing that cannot be forgiven. And unless you deal with that, you'll not get forgiveness from the Father in heaven. 1 John 3.11, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Now, he's, about to, he's about to bring in Cain here. What was the first murder? Cain and Abel, his own brother. His own brother, his own flesh and blood brother. The first siblings, you talk about sibling rivalry, right? It started at the beginning. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. It's all about bringing the right sacrifice to God. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So the question, does the evil heart of Cain burn within you or I? Now, like Cain, we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. You can't change that. You can't change that. Sin has filled our hearts, and we too must master the sin. So what Cain could not do, we can because a sacrifice has been brought. Jesus paid the price. You and I no longer have to be dead in our sins. Hallelujah. You can be alive in Christ. He empowers us to overcome sin. Amen. And to love others. Doesn't mean you always like everything somebody else does, but you can love them. Let me ask you, have you ever liked everything your child's ever done? Now, hang on. When were you a child? Did you ever do anything that displeased your parents? And all the angelic saints set up straight. Some have lost their memory. They can't remember. Let me, let me remember for you. I guarantee you did. That's what Mike told me. So anyway. Sure. And the fact is, the ground is level at Jesus' cross. We're all guilty of murder somewhere in the sense of what Jesus told us. 
is actually my sin. I help, if, if you want to call it murder Jesus, I help murder him. Because he actually came because of me. The things I did, I was one of those that caused him to hang there. And I think it was, was I think Sal and I were talking this morning, and it just kind of hit me. I, you know these scriptures, they, they've been around, and you, you read them 500 times, and yeah, 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 I know what it says, yeah, 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 yeah. But like for a moment, I began to think about he's hanging on the cross. Now, I, I, just setting up the whole pain inventory of what Jesus is feeling at that point. He's already been hanging there for hours. His back has been flayed open with, with the, the cat of nine tails. You don't want to experience that. None of us do. But, you know, we're tough, right? Only Jesus was truly tough. We're not tough. Spit, beaten, mocked. It's bad enough, the, the physical pain, but his lordship and his kingship. See, they, at that moment, they didn't see before he came to earth as a baby what he was like in heaven. They were destroying royalty. Touching something made it common that was so uncommon they had no right. Now, if it had been you and I, what would you be thinking if you were in his shoes? If it's you, not Jesus, if you were there where he was at, what would be going through your mind? Would you be angry? Would you, you probably couldn't wait to exact revenge on you low down scum and you use other words than I would be, right? Your anger would be full tilt. And what does Jesus do? <laughs> With what strength he had, he looks up to his father, whom he had never been separated in all of eternity, and says, Father, forgive them. They have no clue what they're doing. Are you kidding me? No, wait a minute, Jesus, you, you know... Don't you remember what I did in high school? How do you forgive that? Father, forgive them. He didn't even know what he was doing. For a moment, it just crushed my heart. I thought, God, I've been a murderer. I'll murder the Son of God. And I never met him up to that point. John 10, 18, no one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up. This command, get this, I receive from my father. His dad commanded, you have to do this, son, because of my love for them. I love you, but unless you don't, do, I can't say you understand the kind of love it took where you're sitting today? How could you reject that? I asked myself that many times. Jerry, how could you have just kept rejecting that? When I knew, I'd heard. Some of you know James Robinson, who that is. James is, I think he's about 80 years old now, about 80. He's had a ministry for a number of years, but some of you may not know his beginning. It's an ending. I want to share this with you today. He has dug more water wells, I think, in Africa than anybody I know of. His ministry is called Life Today and his wife. And I know he's told his story before, but see, he was a product of a rape. And later, he almost shot his father. And then he took his surname. His mother was a practical nurse. She was caring for an elderly man in his home. At 40 years of age, she had never had a child. She had been married and divorced. And she found herself being approached that day by the alcoholic son in the family. And he forced his affection on her. Robinson said, I would assume from what she has shared in the past that it wasn't violent, but it was a forced moment of his uncontrolled passion and in a sexual relationship, and she conceived a child that she was not supposed to be able to have at age 40. The year was 1943, 80 years ago. She went to a doctor and asked for an abortion, and out of deep conviction, the doctor refused. 1943, not 73, 43. Later, she said that she prayed about it and thought that she should have the child. 
and age 41, she gave birth to me. So I'm unexpected, I'm unwanted, and she went on to put an ad in the newspaper in Houston, Texas, and asked for someone to get a baby boy, someone who cared and who would be compassionate. So a couple named Reverend and Mrs. H.D. Hale from Pasadena, Texas, answered that ad, came, got him, tried to adopt him, and kept him till he was five years of age. Then my mother came and took me back from them, and for the next, next 10 years, we moved 15 or 16 times. We lived in abject poverty. He said, to say that we lived in a most dysfunctional situation would not be an exaggeration. When I was 14, this alcoholic that raped my mother came back into our lives. He choked my mother. She passed out. I thought he killed her. He then came into my room and threatened to kill me, but I almost killed him. I pointed a high-powered rifle in self-defense at him, and I would have shot him if he had moved his hand rather than just curse me for a while. James says, when I look back on it, and many have asked me, why do you think your father didn't move toward you when you had the rifle pointed at him? He said, I don't think that pastor and his wife and their little congregation of believers ever stopped praying for a little boy that they in many ways lost track of. Imagine how it broke their heart. I believe somehow prayer was powerful enough that it held my alcoholic father in place until the police arrived and arrested him. After that, I left that home. I went back to live with the pastor and his wife at age 14. He went on to say, God called me to preach at 18. By the time I was 19, Billy Graham had found out about our ministry. And, I took it, and took it, he took an interest in our ministry. By the time I was 20, the city crusades were, were citywide, holding the stadiums, coliseums. 20 million people attended crusades and millions came to Christ. I ended up on television at Billy Graham's suggestion. And the television ministry is carried around the world. It's called Life Today. And God has greatly blessed it. Wow. See, one decision against murder has changed millions of lives. That's just how it works, isn't it? murder why does God hate it because it destroys those he loves who made in his image and you and I have no right to destroy that through murder amen